come back again. Um, and anyway, they, so they, the animals fill, uh, and it, w when they carry sensors, they tell us something about themselves. And when we look at, at their distributions uh, relative to other properties, in this case, I plotted oxygen, you see that the bluefin tuna and the sharks you know, line up pretty nicely around the edge of the low oxygen minimum zones. So there is some uh, 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 exclusion of them from those areas. That's probably what's happening out here in the Western Pacific during El Nino, La Nina, when the skip chops are going one way and then coming back. Uh, the, uh, uh, if you look at the distribution of the animals relative to the temperatures they're in, they seem to be uh, uh, um, tagging into uh, certain areas. And then I want to go on to the next uh, 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 technology. And, and this is one that I uh, uh, am trying to learn at my advanced age. It might be a mistake. Uh, but it's, it's the idea of using genomics and something that is being called environmental G DNA. And next year, this will probably have a different name to it. If, if uh, uh, after we all left this room, a forensic scientist came in and vacuumed the floor and ran uh, th those samples through some kind of a DNA analyzer, and he had a library of all the people in the world, he could figure out that we were all here based on our, our, our DNA. The same thing seems to happen in the ocean. Everything sloughs material. And so uh, uh, the ocean is a genetic soup of its resident species. What that means is that we don't actually have to go observe them. We can take water that we've collected with uh, 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 advanced systems and analyze them for, uh, uh, for their genetic content. And there's at least two approaches. One is to sequence everything through next generation sequencing and then look at what was in that particular sample. Uh, that is... Uh, um, a great thing, although quantitatively it becomes a little dip more difficult because what happens if you happen to have a bigger piece of something else and then you amplify that and it, and it seems like you have a lot of one thing when it was actually one piece of another. Anyway, you can see that it's not completely straightforward. It, it, is, it tells us if something has been there or not, but, but quantitatively it becomes a little harder. The other way is since we have, have, have sequenced uh, a, a lot of the animals in the world, many of them, we can f use that information to find places in their genome that, is con that are conserved. And we can build these primers. And, and then we can use those primers much more easily in the laboratory. And we can also actually uh, uh, put that uh, uh, chemistry on vehicles and in the ocean much more easily. So we can, we can uh, build into uh, uh, devices the ability to do what is called quantitative PCR on board vehicles. So one can dream about putting things like that on floats and other things in the future, and that future is probably at least a decade or so away. But let, let me show you a little bit, a couple of things that maybe can convince you that some of this may be more than smoke and mirrors. And this is uh, uh, some work that was done by our colleagues, our partners in this MBON project that Frank mueller Carger and I are involved in uh, at Stanford, where they went out and they took, uh, uh, they, they dove off of Hopkins Marine Station. I don't know if so many of you probably have been to Hopkins, or some of you have. Uh, and they took with them a, uh, a water container, or several water containers, and they were counting uh, animals that they saw as they went out. And as they were counting, they were collecting water samples along this transect. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, orange values are values that are from the uh, diver counts, and the blue ones are from the uh, eDNA analysis. And I have, I didn't, I'll admit, I picked some of the best uh, uh, ones here. Uh, some of the ones that didn't work as well were things like flatfish, where it was very, if you're a diver and you've been down and you try to find a flatfish, it's kind of hard to find him uh, in the water. But the, you know, it shows you that, uh, uh, to some degree, these things are real. And it also picked up, of course, things that the divers couldn't see. You know, there was a lot of droppings from cormorants, probably, and, and, the, and the, uh, 
the, the distribution in space kind of matches it. You expect the seabirds to be close to shore on the rocks and, and things like dolphins to be uh, much further offshore. And then more recently, uh, we've been, uh, we started to play around with these things and, and it, we started to look at uh, a phenomena that had been occurring off of our institute and this is actually in Bari. My office happens to be right here. Uh, and, and this was actually photoshopped. It, the whales were quite exactly <laughs> li li like that. But no, we, I could sit in, in my office, and this changed it, it, for, you know, we never, for periods of years, we'd never seen many whales out there. And, and it turns out that there, uh, uh, I, don't ha I don't show you the pictures, but Moslani used to be a whaling station many, many years ago. Uh, there was a pier that was just recently torn down where they would launch their uh, harpoon boats from uh, to get the whales. And I, you, know, you could see them breaching. And, and if you look carefully at this image, it, this, is, this uh, uh, humpback is lunch feeding through a, uh, a school of anchovies. And so these, these little speckles here are anchovies flying all over the place. And if you, if you, we did a little surveying and found that indeed there was this uh, uh, concentration right in, along the mouth of the canyon. And then during one of our cruises, we, we used some echo sounders and, uh, uh, on the ships and went over the canyon and found this mass of uh, material here, and we knew it was fish. And uh, we didn't know exactly what fish it was, but fortuitously, uh, the day after this cruise, or a couple of days after the cruise, uh, one of our ROVs went down to deploy something for Charlie Pole at the bottom of the canyon. And when they got to the bottom of the canyon, they could not see. They had lights on, but the fish that were there were so thick that they could not see. And then when they came back up, they, they had a, 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 a whole bunch of anchovies in them. I, I was kidding Brad Seibel saying that we built the most expensive net in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so this, this was a co uh, uh, corroboration that uh, these, uh, and, and these organisms, this was actually kind of new to the fishery scientists. They also always, also always felt that the anchovies were much uh, shallower uh, fish. This was actually at 200 meters, and we have records from the ROV even deeper than that. And they're hiding in the canyon during the daytime, and they come up to feed at night. That was, uh, 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 we were using, we had uh, uh, 38 and uh, 120. That was 120, I think. Yeah. And, and during that same cruise, we collected w water for um, the eDNA, and we ran the pri anchovy primers, and the distribution of the primers looked very much like the distribution of the whales. And so uh, I had... Uh, uh, and oceanographers are like this. We collect samples that we don't know what we're going to collect them for. I, I had collected a whole bunch of samples for uh, 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 some optical analysis, and I had frozen them in liquid nitrogen. I said, well, I'm going to sacrifice those. And those went back 10 years. I'm going to sacrifice some of those, and I'm going to see if I can get anchovy eDNA from them to see if the time series looks at all like the... Uh, and the, it looks like there is something there. So this goes... you know the. the these, there was no whale sightings here, and then all of a sudden the whale sightings started in, uh, and the last two years have the highest eDNA that we had found. And in fact, this year, if, if we didn't have this year, uh, uh, maybe, maybe it would be a perfect story, but it's a pretty clean story. We have additional samples, and I think we will look at those uh, to see if we can uh, fill in things. Anyway, again, just to show you that uh, some of these techniques may uh, show some promise. Get, get back to the platforms, and I'm almost done here. I think I'm almost on time. Uh, I want to focus on these long-range AUVs that have been developed at, at, at Embari, which are wonderful platforms uh, and, and have opened up a, a lot of new ways of doing things, I think. And, and then we, after these were developed, and I'll show you a little bit more about them, then we, uh, 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 my boss in particular started to think about how do we put some of these ecogenomic sensors on these vehicles. So now one can imagine that if we have these techniques and we can put them on vehicles, 
then we can uh, uh, actually have an autonomous way of collecting the information um, without having to uh, go to sea or, ha or being doing it. We, have, we don't have to be waiting for a, a day of ship time, which is very hard to schedule, et cetera, et cetera. Preaching to the choir, probably. Okay, so the, uh, a little bit about these vehicles. Uh, they're kind of a hybrid between a glider and a uh, uh, bigger uh, AUV. They have a buoyancy engine, so you can actually have them drift, or because they're smart enough, you can tell them, why don't you follow an isotherm? So if it starts, you know, if, if it starts to get warmer, go deeper. Uh, you can do things of that nature. You can, you can uh, shift the, just like the gliders, the gliders move their center of gravity forward and backward to go down or up. They move the center of gravity left or right to glide. Uh, these vehicles can do uh, uh, some of that as well. And they have uh, shorter or longer noses. You can extend the nose and add. Uh, you lose uh, uh, velocity and uh, uh, duration of uh, deployment, but uh, you can add additional uh, payloads. And with, with rechargeable batteries, you can run them for 14 days. With uh, primaries, you can run them for almost a month. And uh, I think battery technology is only getting better, so that I expect that that will become even better. Just a comparison, T took the ship of three days to get out here, stopping uh, uh, doing CDD casts, uh, of course, and though that, that added to the transit time. It took the L this LRUV seven days to go out, uh, and this is about um, nine, uh, this was, was 1,800 kilometers. Is this 900 kilometers out here? Seems like it's a long way. Uh, and, and it took this, that a glider three times that long. And the uh, LRUV did a whole bunch of other stuff. When it came back here, it followed a drifter and uh, it did some work in here before it came in. Uh, this w the, the next tr uh, image I'll show you is a tracking of a drifter. It ha doesn't happen to be that drifter. Uh, these ESP, these environmental sensor processors, which have gen genomic sensors on them, can, were deployed as drifters early on. And this is the track of this AUV, which you know, was getting the, the position of the drifter sent to, back to it uh, in real time, and it was using that information to uh, uh, try to map around the... Uh, uh, the drifter in a Lagrangian framework, and if you take that and put it around that, you see this is the, the tracks of the drifter in a Lagrangian frame uh, with its center right here. So it can do things uh, uh, pretty intelligently. And then we can uh, uh, use the sensor data that the vehicles have on board to decide where to sample. So as the uh, uh, vehicle uh, goes up past a chlorophyll maximum and says this is the depth of that maximum, it can then turn around and collect a sample as it goes down through that. Uh, and uh, it can do the same with uh, different types of algorithms. Uh, I, uh, on board, these vehicles have the ca capability of collecting water or samples. And you can define any algorithm that you want on the vehicle and say, autonomously decide when the stratification is such and take a sample or things of that nature. Uh, I'll tell just a few more details of the ESP nose. Uh, the, the, it has uh, um, some advanced technology, obviously. The filters that it collects are actually in these little cartridges. Uh, and then we've actually taken some of those samples and analyzed them for uh, NGS in the same way, sorry, as we uh, uh, showed you earlier, and we actually ran some anchovy primers and during one of the testing runs and actually detected the anchovies in the sample. Okay, so I'm done. Uh, um, I think these time series globally distributed are key. They've taught us about variability. Uh, maintaining these is difficult. Uh, we not only new, need new technologies, but uh, and I didn't really talk about this here, but a transition with a, to long-term process studies, because the processes that drive ecosystem change are changing, and so we our models are tuned 
to the, to the processes that we know, the uh, uh, black swan concept. But these, are, these things are changing. And I argue that because of that, many of the things that we, we many of our dogmas regarding how the world is going to change are probably incorrect. Uh, and we need to be flexible. I'm not a climate change denier. I'm just saying that we may be wrong in some of the things that we think. Uh, and, and that these future observing systems uh, uh, will be mostly autonomous. Frank doesn't think we can do that in Venezuela, but I think we can. Uh, and uh, I've already said these things. So I'll, I'll stop here and take questions if you have any. Uh, they have propellers, uh, uh, but, but they're very efficient. But they have propellers, so they're not only gliding, but they they have a little extra oomph to them. Uh, and most of the glider manufacturers are actually adding little propellers to theirs now, mainly to get them out of trouble, because uh, there are times when when the uh, 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 current speeds are uh, faster than they can glide, and, and they get into trouble at times. And so they're putting uh, 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 small pro propellers on them as well, but they don't have enough um, battery capacity to run those for very long. Yes? Um, so you mentioned towards the beginning the uh, selves and pyrosomes and the, the tuna crab showing up in, in uh, association with that warm water law, which was 2014. So I was wondering, um, now that again we're getting on these and more kind of warm water, are they showing up again? Or Actually, that, most of that was with, associated with the El Nino. It was after the blob. Um, and it was, yeah, so that, and we, we know that they, have, uh, that they had to be carried by uh, anomalous currents. And unfortunately, we don't have a good handle on the observations of currents during these, at least off of California. But m many of the uh, organisms that came up ca are, are not capable of swimming that fast. Uh, many of them actually recruited there, so we know they're larval, um, things like the parrotfish. Uh, there were baby parrotfish around, which meant that they probably came up as uh, larvae and then grew up there. So m most of those uh, anomalous creatures showed up during El Nino, not during the blob. Yes? Yeah, I think those... Uh Data on the DNA are just amazing uh, and may really change our insight in, in what we see on life in the oceans. How much are you dealing with, say, data overload or information overload? Since you showed us some data on fish and whales and things like that, but you know, how about if we also want to look at diatoms and things at the base of the food chain? I mean, the information is all there, right? But how are we going to deal with it? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I didn't show you, we, we do also do traditional uh, microscopy at work and, and the, the, diet, the communities changed pretty much at the same time as everything else did. Uh, but the new technologies, yes, I think are going to put a burden on our uh, data management capabilities and we're spending a fair amount of time in, the, in this new project trying to deal with that. Um, but I still think we're data poor relative to some of the other uh, disciplines. So, but it, it's not something we, we can uh, uh, look at lightly. There's a, we're up here. Um, for, the, for the AVs, can you, you can't give them new instructions on the slide, right? Yes, can you, you can, can. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they come up and, and talk, on a regular, just like you can to the gliders as well. Yeah, you can tell them, yeah, we do this all the time, we tell them, Oh, you know, and what we like to get to the point where that information, the information about where the interesting things are goes back to them automatically. So we're working with uh, animal tagging folks so that if the, the, the animals know uh, better where to go.
to the hot spots. So we, they think there's a lot of, you know, if you look at the average concentration of things, even in a productive area like Monterey, it can't support the biota that's there. Things, ha there has to be these places where things are concentrated. Uh, and the animals go there to feed. And so we'd like to be able to use the information from the animals to tell the robots to go there and find out what is special about those areas. So yeah, we can, and, and, and they can actually communicate with each other too. Uh, acoustic yeah, yep. You had a question? Oh, right. Well, I have two. Uh, the first one was, you know, NSF has put this great investment and push for ocean observatories with cable route uh, setups, but I didn't hear you talk as much about that. Is, does that play less of a role in the type of work you're doing? Um, well, no, I mean, it's a different, it's, it's a, uh, um, the OI, uh, it is the, 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 its main piece is a fixed location, and many of the things that we are talking about here can work in conjunction with that, right? You, you can uh, have those things docked to it, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't think we can afford to globally distribute the OI infrastructure, and, and maybe we can glo afford to globally distribute some of the things here. But I think they're complementary, and uh, um, but they're just a different way of doing things. Okay. My second question was, you showed a slide in the San Francisco area that the average sea level has risen by three feet, uh, one meter, it looked like. And over 100 years. Over 100 years? Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering what happened across the meter. Yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> yeah. A hundred, uh, uh, it was a, a century long oh. record. Yes? So I was looking interested in your slide of the animals that you Based on that image, that you actually tag some jellyfish, is that true? Yeah, they're trying to do that. They're the, they're the easiest one. So we, the reason we want to do that, one of the reasons we want to do that, is that we can follow them with the vehicles. And, and, you know, it's, it's kind of hard for the vehicles, even though they're sort of fast, you know, trying to keep up with a great white shark or a, or a bluefin uh, is still a pretty challenging uh, endeavor. <laughs> But no, they are, there are, there are uh, scientists at our institute that are very interested in jellyfish uh, dynamics and uh, they're starting to put tags on them. What are some other things that they're tagging? Some other species that they're tagging? Seabirds and uh, uh, all different varieties of sharks. Uh, even, they, they're getting to the place, of course, where they, they tag the small salmon a lot now. Because, and then they put picket fences like it, when in the rivers, and you can count them as they go in and out up in the rivers, and so um, they're, they're, things are getting smaller and smaller uh, fast. Yes. Yeah, so I have two questions. One is about the uh, the EPA. Uh, is, is that quantitative or is that just a qualitative assessment of presence absence? And the second question is, is: I see your time series that you go back decades, two decades. And you can correlate it fairly well, obviously, anchovies and sardines. But I'm sure there's traditional people that have been working